Now I would like to talk about random errors. Random errors are fluctuations due to unpredictable variations in the measurement system. These unpredictable variations may come from a number of factors. They might be coming from the environmental inputs, they might be coming from the overall structure of the measurement system or because of human error if humans are involved. One thing we know about these random errors is that they are normally fluctuations on both sides of the true value. Therefore, one common way of removing random errors is by repeating the measurement procedure and averaging the results out. You might have used this kind of technique when you were performing some physics experiment where you were trying to measure the time period of a pendulum. You would have tried to measure the time period of the pendulum multiple times and at the end averaged those time periods. Because if you measured the time period for the pendulum by using just one swing, that would have been quite inaccurate. Normally, statistical analysis is used to remove these random errors. And averaging out the reading was one way of implementing these statistical methods. So let us understand these things through another example. Let's suppose that different observers are asked to measure the length of a steel bar using some measuring instrument. We have divided the observer into two groups that is A and B. And the readings which we got from group A are listed as reading A and the readings we got from group B are labeled as reading B. For reading A, we can see over here that the mean is 409 and the median is 408. Whereas for the same steel bar, the mean for reading B is 406 and median is 407. So which reading is correct? Note one thing over here that mean and median will approach each other if we keep on repeating the experiment for infinite times. But for limited repetitions, mean and median have slightly different values. But if we compare the two groups, the mean value is quite different. So which group has performed well or how can we be sure about the accuracy of the mean value? Note one thing that in reading A, the spread of the readings is quite larger than that of the reading B. That is, in reading A, the minimum value which someone measured is 394 and the maximum value is 430. Whereas in reading B, the minimum value is 402 and the maximum value is 409. So we have a spread of approximately 7 points in reading B, whereas in reading A, this spread is of about 26. Obviously, we are going to go with reading B because we know that the amplitude of the random error or the spread in the data is far less than that of reading A. So we will have more confidence in the mean or median value calculated for reading B. But is there any way to quantify this spread so that our automatic systems can automatically figure out the spread in the incoming values? Yes, of course there is a way. And this thing is called standard deviation and variance. You might have calculated standard deviation or variance of a group of data in your probability and statistics course. The formula for calculating variance and standard deviation is given over here. What we do is we calculate difference between each value and the mean value and call it D. Then we take the square of these differences and add them up and later on divide it by one less than the number of readings. This thing is called variance and if we take square root of it that would be called standard deviation. The standard deviation is typically an RMS value. That is, we are firstly taking the square, then the mean, and then at the end, square root. Can you calculate the standard deviation and variance of these measurement sets, which we used earlier? The calculations for figuring out variance and standard deviation are given over here. Here in the first step, we have calculated the deviations or the differences from the mean for group A. Then we squared those differences or deviations. After that, we added those deviations up and divided by one less than the number of measurements. 
So for group A, the variation come out to be 137. And when we took the square root of it, the standard deviation would be 11.7. Similar method can be followed for readings of group B. And you would come up with a variance of 4.2 and standard deviation of 2.05. Now you can see that the standard deviation associated with reading B is far less than the standard deviation of reading A. So we would have more confidence on the measurements of reading B because they are more precise. Or we can say that the instrument or the system used for reading B was more precise. If the error involved in the reading is truly random, then taking the average of infinite readings will remove this randomness. And if we are averaging out infinite readings, then it would be equal to calculating mean or median of the signal. But in practical cases, we cannot have infinite readings. So if we average out or take the median of the readings which we have got, there will still be some error in the mean value. And this error is called standard error of the mean and can be calculated using this formula. The derivation of this formula is out of scope of this lecture because it is more related to probability and statistics. So I would be skipping it and would request you to use this formula as it is. However, if you are interested in the derivation of this formula, you can consult any probability and statistics literature. Apart from these statistical methods, we can have a graphical data analysis technique as well. And I will show you that these techniques are easy to use and are more practical. Suppose that for the same example, we have generated another group of readings labeled as reading C. To start with the graphical data analysis technique, the first thing is we require a histogram of these values. So can you generate the histogram of these values? And before generating the histogram, can you tell me that what is a histogram? A histogram is a graphical way of representing repetitive data. For the reading C, this will be the histogram. What I have done over here is I have created bins of two units and have analyzed the data that how many data points are lying in those bins. For example, in the first bin, there is only one reading. That is, one reading is between 401.5 and 403.5 whereas there are five readings in the total data set that are lying between the second bin, that is the bin of 403.5 to 405.5. Similarly, the data points lying in other bins have been shown by the bars of those bins. The larger the bar, the more points are lying in that bin. If you can notice over here, I have labeled the x-axis with measurements and the deviations as well. It is more practical to use deviations if we are talking about errors and these deviations are deviations from the mean value. So what I have done, I have calculated the mean value and subtracted that mean value from each data point. Over here, I am supposing that the mean value is the true value or the true measured value. So that removing that true value from the overall value leave me with only the errors or the deviations. So what will happen if we increase the number of readings to infinite readings? One obvious thing would be that we would not be needing any bins because each reading will be a bin itself. Now as each reading will act as a bin itself, you can say that the size of the bin has reduced to a point and all the bins have come so much closer to each other that the histogram will not look like a bar graph but it will look like a continuous graph. This thing is called frequency distribution curve. Here is an example of one frequency distribution curve. Note that on the x-axis there are deviations whereas on the y-axis there is frequency of those deviations. Each reading in the data set will correspond to some deviation. Can you figure out what this central deviation would mean, that is DP? 
as we have subtracted mean value from all the readings, if the mean value is the true output, then this DP should be zero. A non-zero DP represents a systematic error in the output. Normally, we normalize this frequency distribution curve so that on the y-axis, the maximum value can go up to one and this normalized frequency distribution curve is then called probability curve. And the height at any particular deviation is called probability density function. Now, as the x-axis is representing deviations, that is deviation from the mean value, you can figure out what are the chances that deviation from the mean value is between D1 and D2. To calculate the probability that the error lies between D1 and D2, you have to figure out the area under this curve between these two points. This area will represent the probability that the deviation will lie between D1 and D2. Or in other words, the probability that error would lie between D1 and D2. If you have generated this data by repeating some experiment infinite times or a large number of times, it would be quite difficult for you to calculate these probabilities. It would be much easier if we can come up with some mathematical function that can describe this curve. So, in the field of probability and statistics, Gaussian distribution is something that resembles this type of curve. Gaussian distribution is also known as normal distribution or bell-shaped distribution and the mathematical function for this distribution is given by this. You can see that this formula is relying on the actual values, the mean value and the standard deviation. So if we can generate this kind of bell-shaped curve and the mean value of deviation is zero, that is there is no systematic error in our reading then probability that the data point will lie between one standard deviation that is plus minus sigma is 68% and probability that any reading will lie between plus minus two sigmas would be 95.4% and similarly probability that any reading will lie between plus minus three sigma would be 99.7% or conversely we can say that there might be 0.3% chances that the error will go beyond 3 sigma. However, normal practice is to state the error within 95% confidence level and not within 2 or 3 sigma confidence level. This 95% confidence level means that there are 95% chances that error would be less than a particular value. This is the thing that is quoted in the data sheet as an accuracy. This 95% confidence level will correspond to 1.96 sigma. And how we came up with this 1.96 sigma from the previous graph? You can see that the error would lie between plus minus 2 sigma with a confidence level of 95.4. So if we reduce this confidence to 94, the deviation boundary will reduce to 1.96. And don't forget to include the standard error of the mean, that is alpha, which we calculated earlier. Let us understand this concept or these difficult things through an example. Suppose that a standard mass is measured 30 times with the same instrument to create a reference data set. And the calculated values of the standard deviation, that is sigma and alpha are 0.43 and 0 0.08 respectively. If the instrument is then used to measure an unknown mass and the reading is 105.6 kg, how should the mass value be expressed? Or what is the expected error in this value? So using the value of standard deviation and alpha, the error would be 0.92, which means that there is a 95% chances that the error in this reading, that is 105.6 kg, would be less than 0.92 kg. And there would be 5% chances that error might exceed 0.92 kg. This is how we are going to represent this reading. That is 105.6 plus minus 0.9 kg.
and it is understood that this accuracy is of 95% confidence level. Normally, a measurement system is an aggregation of different instruments. So any measurement coming from a measurement system can include both the systematic errors and the random errors in it. So we need some way of aggregating these errors and represent these errors with one number. One way of expressing the combined error would be to sum the two separate components. That is, the total possible error is the systematic error plus the random error. However, a more usual and standard way as described in the ANSI SME 1985 standard is that you square the systematic error and add up into the square of the random error and then take the square root of it. Moreover, if multiple instruments are used to calculate some measured value or to come up with some measured value, then how you can add the errors involved in all those measuring instruments. So there can be two major cases. The first case is when you are adding the values coming from two different measuring instruments or you are subtracting those values. So if the two readings from different instruments are added or subtracted, then the error is combined in this way. Over here, AY is the error in the first reading and BZ is the error in the second reading. Let us try to understand this thing through an example. Suppose that a circuit requires a resistance of 550 ohms, but you don't have this 550 ohms resistance with you. What you have is you have a 220 ohm resistance and a 330 ohms resistance. So what you can do is you can combine these two resistance in series. Now, if each resistance has a tolerance of plus minus 2%, what would be the total error in the total resistance? Can you figure it out? Let me do it for you. 2% 2 of 220 would be 4.4, whereas 2% 2 of 330 would be 6.6. .6. Taking the square of both of these numbers and adding them up and then square rooting it, we would be left with around 7.93. And if we convert this error into percentage, it would be about 1.44%. Another thing that can happen is you are dividing or you are multiplying two readings coming from two different instruments. So how the errors would combine? In this case, the errors are simply added up. So let us try to understand this thing through an example. A rectangular sided block has edges of lengths A, B, and C, and its mass is M. If the values and the possible errors in those values are shown like this, can you figure out the value of the density and the possible error in that value? So to figure out the density, we need mass and the volume. So in the solution, you can see that when you'll multiply A with B, the error would be 1% plus 1%. And when you multiply the product of A, B with C, the error will once again be added up. So now you'll have a possible error of 3%. And in the last step, when you divide the mass with the volume, the error will once again be added up. So the error in the volume is 3%, whereas the error in the mass is 0.5%. So when you will add these things up, the possible error would be 3.5%. With this example, I hope that you have understood what errors are, what are the sources of errors, how systematic and random errors may be induced into your system, and what are ways of figuring out those errors and removing them. This is everything for this lecture. Take care and goodbye.